Dwight Eisenhower, please stand up. <laughs> Today, we review the impact of Eisenhower's legacy on civil rights. Historians have looked at his record in this area and have come to very different conclusions. When Eisenhower assumed the presidency, the armed, so armed services had recently been integrated, but segregation still held firm in public schools. No Civil Rights Act had been passed since 1875, and the power of the military had not been used to protect the interests of African Americans since the Reconstruction period. By the end of his presidency, the Brown versus Board of Education decision in the Supreme Court upended the notion of separate but equal education. Federal troops had been sent into Little Rock, Arkansas to enforce integration of a high school. And the Civil Rights Acts of 1957 and 1960 passed into law. In some ways, President Eisenhower pushed the currents of history to open greater opportunities for black people in the United States. However, in other ways, he seemed to build dams that reinforced prejudice. Assessments of, the, of Eisenhower's civil rights contributions written in the 1970s and 1980s pointed out the shortcomings in his record. In his memoirs, Earl Warren, appointed by Eisenhower as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, remarked on the President's lack of enthusiastic support for civil rights. The historian, Stephen Ambrose, described the ways Eisenhower worked to eliminate discrimination in areas where federal authority clearly took precedence, but showed the president's reluctance to intervene in states. For example, by 1953, Eisenhower worked through his aide, Max Rabb, and the Secretary of the Navy, Robert Anderson, to complete the desegregation of the Navy and Air Force, leaving only a few segregated Army units, which would, own, which would also be a memory by the end of the administration. However, in the case of the Fair Employment Practices Commission, the President opposed renewal of this agency, which was intended to prevent discrimination in defense employment. He justified his decision based on the belief that federal mandates would only hold back progress because they interfered with the voluntary cooperation between blacks and whites at the local and state levels. Every elected official, he believed, should, quote, promote justice and equality through leadership and persuasion, unquote. According to Ambrose, this reluctance to take a more aggressive stance on civil rights stemmed from the president's desire to win the votes of white Southerners. Other scholars echoed Ambrose's conclusions. In the book, The Presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower, Chester Page Jr. and Elmo Richardson explained that in addition to political concerns, Eisenhower was also part of a culture so inured to segregation that he was blinded to the commonplace injustices that it fostered and the power hierarchies that it maintained. His acceptance of this system came from his life experiences, such as growing up in Kansas, where segregation was practiced, working in the segregated military, and socializing with friends who made jokes about black people. His experiences probably also made him instinctively aware of the violent response that would result from any attempt to change the system. Quote, if we, mere, if we attempt merely by passing a lot of laws to force someone to like someone else, he warned, we are just going to get into trouble, unquote. With these words, I can imagine him echoing the thoughts of many white people in both the North and the South who envisioned a day when African Americans would be treated as equal Americans and an equal part of society 
just not right now or in the foreseeable future. Those who criticize Eisenhower on civil rights often point out that he did not use the bully pulpit of the presidency to push this issue forward, to play a role in changing people's hearts and minds about the issue. His reticence came to the fore most glaringly after the Supreme Court delivered its unanimous decision striking down segregated schooling in the Brown versus Topeka Board of Education case. When the Supreme Court announced the decision in May 1954, the president made no public comment about the ruling other than to assert his willingness to obey the court's decision. His perspective on the Brown ruling may have been expressed best in remarks that he made to his staff. Quote, it's all very well to talk about school integration. But you may also be talking about social disintegration. We can't demand perfection in moral questions. All we can do is keep working toward a goal and keep it high. And the fellow who tries to tell me that you can do these things by force is just plain nuts. These comments are the perfect expression of the go slow approach to civil rights, and they have caused many to question his commitment to racial equality, especially when he refused to condemn the Southern Manifesto, a document signed by over 100 Southern congressmen who demanded a retraction of the Brown ruling. In the judgment of historians Page and Richardson, this cautious attitude was understandable given the level of violence and hatred that were unleashed after the verdict. But it was not necessarily fair, they stated, since it tended to favor the status quo. Within the last 10 years, others have evaluated Eisenhower's civil rights legacy in a different light. In part, this reconsideration was sparked by the work of political scientist Fred Greenstein, who wrote The Hidden Hand Presidency in 1982. Greenstein focused on Eisenhower's tendency to appoint highly qualified people who would carry out his policies while insulating him from any fallout that those policies might generate. Greenstein's work revolutionized the way we look at Eisenhower's presidency, causing us to see Ike not as a friendly golfing grandfather, but as a clear-headed strategist, setting the tone on every initiative of his administration. The historian David Nichols, who is a dean at Southwestern College in Winfield, Kansas, applied Greenstein's ideas to Eisenhower's civil rights strategies and created a much different portrait of his contribution to the movement than earlier biographers. Like Greenstein, Nichols emphasized the impact of Eisenhower's personnel choices. The president appointed Herbert Brownell as the attorney general, a man who was committed to civil rights and whose legal brief supporting integration of public schools comprised part of the Supreme Court's information package on the Brown versus Board of Education case. In addition, the appointments to the federal judiciary that Eisenhower made shaped it for decades. The most obvious example of this was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren, who spearheaded the judiciary's dismantling of Jim Crow. In addition, judges like Elbert Tuttle, John Brown, John Minor Wisdom, and Frank Johnson Jr. were appointed to lower federal courts and played key roles in desegregating the South in the 1960s. To screen candidates for such posts, Eisenhower relied on his attorney general, Brownell, who was instructed not to place a known segregationist on the list of judicial candidates. So, true to Greenstein's thesis, Eisenhower gave considerable power 
to a man he trusted who could make the president's objectives a reality. Nichols also reminded readers of the other accomplishments of the administration that have received scant notice over the years. Eisenhower was able to use his credibility as a general to generate compliance on military desegregation so that in less than two years, all combat units were desegregated. He also desegregated schools on military bases in the South before the Brown decision, as well as veterans hospitals. He used the power of persuasion and the prestige of his office to encourage integration of movie theaters and public accommodations in Washington, D.C., and used the capital city as a model for integrating schools in 1955 and 1956. He also appointed the first African-American, E. Frederick Morrow, to be a White House counselor. Finally, Nichols emphasized the president's use of federal power for civil rights. Eisenhower was the first president since Reconstruction to use the military to protect the civil rights of black people when he sent the 101st Airborne to Little Rock, Arkansas to guard nine black high school students who wanted to attend Little Rock Central High School. When this incident occurred in September 1957, he drew the ire of states' rights activists in the South. Yet, as Eisenhower stated after the Brown ruling, quote, the Supreme Court has spoken, and I am sworn to uphold the constitutional processes of this country, and I will obey, unquote. In another exercise of federal authority, the president encouraged the development of civil rights acts in 1957 and 1960, both of which were designed to protect voting rights. Attorney General Brownell draft, helped draft the legislation and wanted stronger provisions than the ones Congress passed. For the president, voting rights were of paramount importance because he believed that by using the vote, black people could gradually change the system that was oppressing them. Nichols's work portrayed Eisenhower as a man shaped by a military mindset who understood and respected the separation of powers and would not assume or usurp the privileges of the judicial or legislative branches. So, Will the real Dwight Eisenhower please stand up? Was he the Eisenhower who accommodated his Southern friends, who made racist jokes, who kept the one black member of his staff, E. Frederick Morrow, at arm's length? Or was he the Eisenhower who appointed judges who would uphold the 14th Amendment, who integrated Washington, D.C., and used the army to break segregated schooling in Little Rock. In many ways, the frustrations we have in pinning down Eisenhower's ideas on civil rights are the same frustrations many of us have with our nation's history as a whole. We have a sense that our country should have given black people the same access to the rights of citizenship and opportunity that it gave to white people. That our president should have seen this and led us toward that goal and not been mired in prejudice or political calculation. President Eisenhower was a man who held the same casual disregard of African Americans that many in his generation held. However, his devotion to the Constitution and to the procedural guarantees of the legal system enabled him to set aside his preconceived notions and take this country to a new place. Or perhaps more accurately, opened enough protected space for the grassroots civil rights activism of African Americans to survive. 
Today, we are fortunate to have panelists who can expand and elaborate on the themes and details I've tried to set out this afternoon. Our first speaker is Mr. Thurgood Marshall, Jr., the son of Thurgood Marshall, Sr., the lawyer whose arguments swayed the Supreme Court in the Brown versus Board of Education case and who later became the first African-American justice on the Supreme Court. Thurgood Marshall, Jr. is distinguished in his own right, graduating from the University of Virginia and the University of Virginia School of Law. As a young lawyer, he clerked for the U.S. District Judge Barrington Parker and served as counsel to various Senate committees. He has also been in public service, serving as an assistant to President Bill Clinton and as the Secretary of the Cabinet of the Clinton Administration. Currently, he is a partner in the international law firm Bingham McCutcheon. But his interests go beyond the legal field. He has wide-ranging interests and is public-spirited, serving on boards as diverse as the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Supreme Court Historical Society, and the Ethics Advisory Committee of the U.S. Olympic Committee, among many others. Newsweek magazine named him one of the 100 people to watch in the new century. And we have the opportunity today to hear him share his insights on the legal issues surrounding the Eisenhower years and the men who shaped them. Following Mr. Marshall, we have Dr. Charles Sanders, an associate professor at my alma mater, Kansas State University. Dr. Sanders received his undergraduate degree from Louisiana State University, a master's in education from North Georgia College, another master's degree from the United States Naval War College, and a PhD from Kansas State, where he has been teaching since 2001. His research is centered on military history, and he has written a well-regarded book on military prisons in the Civil War titled, While in the Hands of the Enemy. One reviewer for the Georgia Historical Quarterly wrote, quote, no one can claim to be a serious student of Civil War prisons until reading Sanders' book, unquote. What I admire most about Dr. Sanders' ability is his skill as a teacher which I've heard about from students and others at Kansas State. One anonymous student posted a comment on the Rate My Professor's website exclaiming, best teacher I have ever had. <laughs> Seriously, Dr. Sanders changed my life and outlook in history and critical thinking. If you go through college without taking a class from him, your education is incomplete. It's the kind of praise that all of us who are university educators envy. Today, Dr. Sanders will give us the benefit of his expertise and skills to analyze Eisenhower's racial views and the Little Rock crisis. So without further expansion on my part, I will turn the microphone over to Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Dr. Speck. And um, I want to thank the library uh, and the foundation for putting together this series of programs and for allowing me to come out and, and participate. Um, it's been a wonderful excuse for me to build on uh, what I have read and studied about uh, President Eisenhower's service to our country. And um, I've, I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, as, as some of you know, we had hoped that former Secretary William Coleman could join us for this discussion. Um, um, but, but his inability to, to join us today gives me a chance to uh, quote from his book, which I promise you he would have done liberally uh, <laughs> this <laughs> afternoon. Um, but as, as uh, a, a true pioneer in his own right, uh, Secretary Coleman's observations um, I, I find highly persuasive in terms of President Eisenhower's contributions and the way in which he went about uh, his job. Um, as, as many of you know, um, the 1952 campaign it did not really touch very much, if at all, on, on civil rights issues. Um, but for those who knew President Eisenhower, it would not have been too much of a surprise that he would tackle um, civil rights issues 
in the various ways that he did with, with courage, and particularly with the, uh, his appointments that Dr. Speck spoke to. Um, I wanted to um, open our discussion um, from my part of the table um, discussing Eisenhower's judicial appointments, partly because of what the judiciary has meant to me as a lawyer and as um, a member of, of the Marshall family, but um, also because they are just remarkably moving stories um, of courage and dedication. And to me, um, for the question marks that, that uh, some have, have raised about President Eisenhower's contribution on civil rights, um, the answers are quite clear looking at, at those judicial appointments. They're also quite clear and positive when you look at his uh, appointments generally, uh, um, and Dr. Speck alluded to that. Um, if you didn't know during the campaign of 1952 where President Eisenhower's um, heart and plans were, you didn't have to spend too much time during his inauguration to get the clue. Because Marian Anderson, who a few years before had made civil rights history in America just two miles away, singing at the Lincoln Memorial, sang at President Eisenhower's inauguration at his invitation. Um, that, uh, to me, whenever I think about it, is, is uh, a powerful and moving statement about how he intended to pursue um, the high calling of that office. Um, his service in the White House, um, if you look, there's a recent, there are a couple of recent books out actually about African Americans who served on the White House staff. As someone who had that experience, um, the, all of us who've had that opportunity look to the people who went before and, and recognize that we stood on their shoulders, but we also recognize that um, when we had those opportunities to serve, that um, the people who came before us were pioneers and they were given those opportunities by the presidents uh, for whom they served. Um, as Dr. Speck mentioned, mentioned President Eisenhower n named the first White House staffer of color, um, Frederick Mooney. Um, there are still tallies on White House staffers of color because those jobs are pretty hard to come by and uh, you know, the numbers are, are noticeable when you've got that small pool. But there were a number of other things that the Eisenhowers both brought to the White House that provide further clues as to the contributions that would be provided by um, his service. Um, they, they walked the walk. They wouldn't go to theaters that were segregated. In fact, they took that a step further and the President brought in the studio heads eventually to the White House to tell them that segregated movie theaters really had no place in our country. Um, he, uh, he had appointments in cabinet agencies that reflected his willingness to provide these opportunities for people of color. Um, Bill Coleman served on a commission that President Eisenhower created, chaired by Branch Rickey. Um, Branch Rickey had uh, integrated baseball by bringing Jackie Robinson in. And I was excited to see, I'm, uh, I'm staying in Junction City, um, and Jackie Robinson did his military service at Fort Riley, so it's, I thought that was, that was a little poignant, and I apologize for the aside, but um, it, it was a reminder to me of, um, of yet another chapter in our history. But if you look back at what Branch Rickey did, um, you know, he didn't exactly create um, a fan base of everybody in the country. Um, it was very courageous, and you think, you take that perspective and Think about what it meant to the country to see President Eisenhower bring Branch Rickey into his administration to run a commission to diversify the federal workforce. Uh, it just is a very powerful statement. Now, Bill Coleman was brought in to serve on that commission as well. Um, Bill has said in his book that he believes that the real tipping point in American history when it comes to civil rights occurred during the Eisenhower presidency. And of course, the primary uh, piece that he points to of that period would be the Little Rock um, school crisis, which um, we'll have a chance to discuss. Um, President Eisenhower very quickly moved during his presidency on a number of fronts, as you've heard, whether it was directing the District of Columbia to desegregate, um, taking President Truman's decision to um, the executive order President Truman signed in 1948 to desegregate the military, taking that and implementing it. Because um, 
as, as we all know, there was a lot more work that needed to be done, um, including the dependent schools and the health care issues, but also in the military units. President Eisenhower, during his military service, had made the case repeatedly to his superiors that during World War II that um, soldiers of color who were doing backbreaking break um, hard, hard labor in support of, of our troops and the Allied cause um, deserved an opportunity to take up arms as well. And uh, these soldiers who, thanks to his, his efforts and those who saw the wisdom in what he was urging, um, impressed even General Patton with their dedication in World War II. So he was, he was very much, President Eisenhower was very much ahead of the curve, and anybody who, um, who wasn't aware of that um, certainly had reason to figure that out pretty quickly during his administration. Um, I want to, because I want to get to the, the questions and discussion, I, I just want to focus, as I said, on the judicial appointments. Um, Dr. Speck mentioned uh, some of the, the crucial judicial appointments who um, served with great courage. My father reminded us regularly that um, he and his, the, the lawyers and support staff that worked on those cases and, and literally risked their lives um, at times um, had it quite easy compared to their clients who would continue to try to live their lives in the communities. The lawyers would come and go. Um, the clients and the judges um, who were trying to protect and vindicate the rights of these clients um, who suffered the same kinds of indignities, who had the same rocks thrown through their windows and firebombs. Um, these judges that, that President Eisenhower put on the courts um, displayed remarkable um, dedication and courage. Um, in, let, me, let me tell you um, a list of some of the decisions that one judge that Dr. Speck mentioned, Dr. Frank John, uh, Judge Frank Johnson, um, issued. And as a federal district judge, um, at least for the first part of his judicial career, he had a full uh, docket of difficult cases. So the, the list of, of decisions that I'm going to describe to you are just a small fraction of his contribution to our society. Judge Johnson invalidated uh, a Tuskegee, Alabama plan to dilute black voting uh, strength. Um, he ordered that uh, black persons be registered to vote if their application per papers were equal in performance of the least qualified a white applicant. Um, he ordered the city of Montgomery, Alabama to surrender its voting registration records to the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, he required Alabama to apportion state legislative districts to adhere to the one adhere to the one man one vote principle, um, he mandated in Alabama the first statewide desegregation of public schools. Um, I can continue through a list um, here of the contributions that this one judge courageously did. Um, it's quite clear to me that President Eisenhower, with the the good counsel in particular of his Attorney General. Um, had no surprises in mind when he made his appointments. He knew the, the positions of these individuals in whom he entrusted um, these powers. Um, Bill, Bill Moyers described Judge Johnson as, um, uh, and said that he altered forever the face of the South. Um, Burke Marshall, a Yale law professor who served with distinction in um, the Kennedy Justice Department, said that uh, these four judges Dr. Speck mentioned them, including Judge Johnson, uh, have made as much of an imprint on American society and American law as any four judges below the Supreme Court have ever done in history. So if you look at these kinds of appointments and the consistency of the moral fiber of the individuals that President Eisenhower put on the court, it's no surprise that uh, someone like Earl Warren was put in the position of Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. I have my theories about where some of the tension um, came from between the two, um, but uh, he also put Justice Brennan on the Supreme Court. And, and Dr. Speck did a wonderful job of explaining the context that we face as a country. I want to give you a little context about what our court system was like during this period. My father's mentor was a man named 
Charles Hamilton Houston, who excelled in law school at Harvard Law School, eventually became dean of Howard Law School, where he um, mentored my father and a number of the lawyers in the civil rights movement. Charles Hamilton Houston um, was clearly a, a brilliant legal thinker and uh, was a tremendous law student at Harvard. Um, to give you an in, a, a clue as to just how much of a pioneer and how brilliant this man was, in 1935, he gave a speech that we recently found at the Library of Congress where he laid out the entire strategy of the school desegregation case. Mm -hmm. That's 1935. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is not, was not a man to be trifled with. I mention that as background because of the context of the court system that President Eisenhower did so much to change. Charles Hamilton Houston went before the Supreme Court in 1938 and argued a case called Gaines versus Missouri to get uh, a gentleman admitted to the Missouri Law School. Rather than listen to a black man argue in the Supreme Court, Justice McReynolds turned his chair around. <laughs> so I mean, if you think about that sort of behavior from a federal judge on the highest court of our land, and then you juxtapose that with the quality of the people that President Eisenhower put on the bench, it's just, it, it's remarkable to me. And I think that, you know, it, it, it bears noting that this was, these were not one-off flukes. There's a consistency through his appointments. And if there's one thing in closing that I would say that I picked up from reading um, most of the Ambrose books, um, it is that General Eisenhower and President Eisenhower sought out people of tremendous fiber, moral fiber and courage. Um, he surrounded himself with these individuals. He, they were drawn to him. For those who worked immediately with him, he mentored them in tremendous ways. For those who were a step or two removed, it's very clear that the example of his service guided them. So it, it's, it's been quite clear to me that although there may have been criticism along the way on individual pieces of his agenda, um, he made a remarkable contribution to our nation's history when it, it, when it comes to a number of things, but in particular on civil rights. I look forward to the discussion. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Speck, for that introduction, especially the line from the students. You have no idea what those things cost you, <laughs> so it's always, good. <laughs> it's always good to hear them, right? Uh, <laughs> and it's always good being back at the Ike. Uh, it, it, this, is, this, is, this is like a second home, and I'm inspired every time I walk on the campus. And to be able to sit to, uh, next to a gentleman like this and hear his words, well, that's, that's just go. My talk today is, uh, is, is, is going to be an echo of, uh, of how Dr. Speck started her talk. Because uh, if you want, you want to talk about Little Rock, right, the first thing you've got to do is you got to get right with Ike. And getting right with Ike is hard to do. I mean, maybe the real Ike never stands up. I don't know. So what we're going to try to do here today is we're going to try to get right with Ike. On his time just prior to the Little Rock crisis and then the crisis itself. Now, I said we, which means that this is not a spectator event, right? I want you to think through this with me. I don't have all the answers. Trust me, right? But think through this with me. And you, I would hope, would also try to do an assessment as we go through it based on the things that Mr. Marshall said and the things that I'm going to tell you. And you try to get right with Ike. He's a man in motion. He was always a man in motion. He's still a man in motion. Listen to this. In a 1962 poll, Arthur Schlesinger Sr. asked 75 presidential scholars to rank order the chief, the chief executives, Washington right up to Eisenhower, based on, quote, their greatness. Of the 31 presidents rated, Dwight D. Eisenhower ranked 21st. He was tied with Chet Arthur, <laughs> <laughs> just above Andrew Johnson. Most of these academics would have agreed at that time with the presidential scholar Lewis Koenig, who said Eisenhower would be remembered primarily as a man who single-mindedly pursued his appetite for leisure and recreation while leaving the day-to-day -day administration of his office to trusted subordinates like assistant to the president, Sherman Adams. 
over the past 50 years, however, these earlier assessments of Eisenhower as a well-meaning but bumbling political novice have been challenged. Drawing on newly opened collections of official records like right here at the Eisenhower and personal papers, Eisenhower revisionists have constructed a new image in which the president emerges as a capable, clever executive who led the nation with a strong hand and a clear vision. The new scholarship has enhanced Ike's reputation dramatically. In 1980, a new poll modeled on that of 1962 placed Eisenhower ninth. He then, in 1990, slipped to 15th. But in the 2010, last year, Siena College Research Institute poll, Ike had once again moved back into the top 10, nudging aside some guy named Kennedy. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, you know, right. Although the results now, this new appraisal, have been significant. The revisionists have focused mainly on Ike in the foreign policy sphere. They have not focused as much on Ike in the domestic sphere, particularly Ike and civil rights. Now, if you try to do Ike and civil rights, you readily understand why that is. It sometimes can be just maddening. Who's the real Ike here? Who's the real guy? Some people have argued that Eisenhower met civil rights reform with ambivalence, if not outright opposition. They say that he failed to develop comprehensive policies, policies and strategies required to implement school desegregation in the South. It was this failure some revisionists maintained that resulted in the crisis that erupted in 1957 in Little Rock. Now, there's no debating these scholars' assertion that Eisenhower was certainly less than enthusiastic in his support of school desegregation. But what I will suggest here today is that their claim that the president's failure resulted from an overriding opposition to civil rights is wrong. I would argue it was wrong. I would argue also that they're wrong when they say that he did not have a consistent administration policy aimed at ending desegregation. I think they missed the mark completely. I maintain that a close examination of the president's personal and public correspondence and actions reveals it, that his approach to all civil rights issues, Eisenhower adhered to a precisely defined strategy. It was based on two things. First, his own personal views on race, of course. But it was based also on his deeply held belief that a course that emphasized moderation and gradualism would prove the most effective in advancing racial equality, while at the same time maintaining law and order in the affected areas. A little bit more about this strategy. This strategy of moderation and gradualism had served Eisenhower well, not only through his administration, but as a military man. You'll recall Ike, V, Monty, and so on. It had served him very well but it will prove completely inadequate to the new set of challenges that developed following the Supreme Court ruling in Brown v. Board. Eisenhower's inability to achieve the objectives that he sought will end in the Little Rock crisis. And that crisis will result, I maintain, directly from his failure to tailor that strategy to meet the new challenges that he faced after Brown. Any analysis of the strategy of Eisenhower, of course, has got to begin with an analysis of the president's personal, personal racial views. We've talked a little bit about it. As you know, Ike was born in Texas. He grew to manhood right here in Kansas. Now, the population of both states was, of course, predominantly white. But surprisingly to me, when I read this, there was a relatively large black population when Ike was growing up right here in Abilene. The schools that Ike attended here in Abilene were integrated. Here, that the future president first displayed what would be a lifelong aversion to bigotry. When a high school coach harassed and then dismissed a black athlete from the football team, team captain Eisenhower told the coach, if he can't play, I won't play either. Other players lined up behind Ike. The coach reinstated 
the black player. However, the fact that Eisenhower was no bigot, and you're going to hear that word however and but a lot today, I'm sorry. I told you, it's work, right? The fact that Eisenhower was no bigot did not mean that he rejected the commonly held racial views of his day. Upon graduation from West Point, he entered the U.S. Army, a U.S. Army that remained segregated for nearly all of his four decades plus of military service. Black soldiers, as Mr. Marshall pointed out, in the main were generally considered unfit for combat duty and were denied training in any but the most rudimentary skills. Eisenhower did not challenge these practices during World War II. And when questioned immediately after the war about possibly integrating the Army, he responded with the statement that would become the cornerstone of his civil rights policy, a statement that Dr. Speck quoted earlier. If we attempt merely by passing a lot of laws to force someone to like somebody else, we're going to get into a lot of trouble. By the end of his military career, General Eisenhower, however, was overseeing, as we heard, the final portions of the integration of the armed forces. And when asked what he thought about that, I expressed the hope that, quote, the human race may finally grow up to the point where it, race relations, will not be a problem. As president, Eisenhower's signals on race relations continued to be mixed. Depending on what you wanted to see in Eisenhower, you could find it. You could look at Eisenhower's personal remarks, for example, and say, there goes a thoroughgoing racist. To presidential speechwriter Arthur Larson, for example, Eisenhower explained that his support for black political and economic equality did not mean that he thought the races should mix, mix socially or that, quote, a Negro should court my daughter. When he returned from golfing trips to Augusta, Georgia, his son remembered that the president would regale the family with, quote, darky jokes told him by his golfing partners in the South. To Chief Justice Earl Warren, he defended the views of segregationists. He claimed that all they are concerned about is to see that their sweet little girls are not required to sit in class alongside some big, overgrown Negroes. But it's troubling. I told you, but. But it's troubling. As these examples may be, they have to be balanced against the many statements and actions that indicate, indicate that Ike did truly favor political and economic equality for blacks. Typical of these pronouncements was a letter to the famous editor of the Atlanta Constitution, Ralph McGill, in which the president emphasized the high cost of discrimination. Until America has achieved reality in the concept of individual dignity and equality before the, the law, he wrote to McGill, we will not have become completely worthy of our limitless opportunities. Eisenhower supplemented these statements with a sincere effort to make blacks more visible at the highest levels of government, as we heard in Mr. Marshall's talk. He asked Sherman Adams at the nominating convention, seek out qualified blacks, bring them in. Lois Lipman joined the White House secretarial staff. Frank Snowden, Howard University, was designated cultural attache to Italy. J. Ernest Wilkins became assistant secretary of labor. And of course, the most significant posting was E. Frederick Morrill as the administrative assistant to the president. Now, detractors have argued that these were just symbolic, but here's the thing you cannot argue with, and that is that black faces appear where none had ever been before. Now, the important distinction that must be noted is that while Eisenhower's support for the political and economic rights of blacks was clear and unwavering, his endorsement of their right to social equality was indeed often weak, and Heston. In a revealing letter to the Republican National Committee or a pres uh, Presidential Committee Chairman uh, Meade Alcorn, Eisenhower suggested that one of the guiding doctrines of the Republican Party should be, quote, equality of all citizens before the law, meaning the political and economic right of no citizen should be jeopardized because of his race or his religion. The obligation of the law was to protect social rights. 
But in Ike's view, those words were open to interpretation and debate. In expressing these views, the President believed that he was addressing the most important concerns of blacks. As Sherman Adams related one time, Eisenhower told me that he disagreed with his Southern friends who contended that Negroes were primarily seeking social equality. He, Eisenhower, believed that the Negro was more anxious for economic equality, an equal chance for a job and a good education, equal justice before the law, equal right to vote. The President was certain then that he possessed a full appreciation of the aspirations of the Negro. And he also believed that he had divined the best policy for achieving those goals. Eisenhower's policy. The President's strategy for whatever goals he saw reflected his core beliefs. Eisenhower, first and last, was a man of moderation. He characterized his approach to problems as the policy of the middle way. And he was utterly convinced that this policy offered the greatest chance for the successful resolution of the difficult problems that surrounded school desegregation. The most important tenet of this policy of the middle way was the avoidance of extremism of all stripes. As Eisenhower explained once to a friend, the critical problem of our time is to find and stay on the path that marks the way of logic between conflicting arguments advanced by extremists of both sides. And that will solve, he said, almost every problem that arises. The proper role for the president in all this, he believed, was that of honest broker, an impartial judge who prevented confrontations by hearing the contending arguments of reasonable men and then rendering a solution that provided the most good for the most people. The second tenet of Eisenhower's policy of moderation concerned the proper role of government in resolving emotional issues. Eisenhower was a firm believer in limited government, and he was extremely skeptical of any solution that advocated the use of law or force to solve fundamental, what he called, human problems. The third tenet of the policy was caution. Gradualism, said Eisenhower, in all things, gradualism. Give the parties a chance to accept and become comfortable with proposed settlements. And the final component of Eisenhower's policy was his preference for minimizing his personal role in any solution that was divine. This was accomplished, as you heard in Dr. Speck's talk, by arranging private meetings with the persons concerned by sending emissaries in the president's name, very low key, behind the scenes, what Greenspan called the hidden hand presidency. It was this policy of moderation constructed around the principles of gradualism, caution, minimum government intrusion, which Eisenhower believed would offer the best sense, best chance in other words, of solving the difficult problem of desegregation. He put this strategy to the test when he completed the desegregation of the armed forces and when he integrated the schools in Washington, D.C. Now, seeing Eisenhower do this, many civil rights advocates hoped his executive activism would now be directed toward ending segregation throughout the country. But they would be disappointed. The same rationale that led Eisenhower to the speedy desegregation of the armed forces and the nation's capital would preclude him from launching any presidential initiative to battle segregation in the schools of the individual states. Eisenhower knew that the real battles over the integration of America's public school systems would, uh, would occur in the Deep South. And although he often stated his belief that the use of, quote, political or economic power to enforce segregation based on race, color, or creed is morally wrong. He also acknowledged that the, the desegregation of public schools in the South would entail, quote, very serious practical problems, not the least of which was what Eisenhower called deep-seated emotions of the persons in the region. 
The Eisenhower administration did little to challenge school segregation in the South. I do not believe Eisenhower wrote in his diary on 24 July 1953 that prejudice will succumb to compulsion. Consequently, I believe the federal law imposed on our states in such a way as to bring about conflict of the police powers of the states and the nation would set back the cause of racial progress and race relations in this nation for a long, long time. How then? was the fight for equality to proceed. Eisenhower provided his solution in a letter to his friend, Governor James Burns of South Carolina. Writing Burns on 1 December, 53, Eisenhower expressed the hope that a means might be found whereby all parties involved in the segregation debate could, quote, progressively work toward the goals established by abst abstract principles, but which would not at the same time cause such disruption and mental anguish that any progress would be reversed. This statement, of course, was in accordance with Ike's policy of moderation. Ike refused to be pinned to a specific date when desegregation would end. He was asked one time, how long will this take? Eisenhower answered, quote, the length of time I am not even going to talk about. I don't know anything about the length of time it will take. In truth, of course, Eisenhower knew that voluntary desegregation, if it ever occurred, would take a very, very long time. What Eisenhower sincerely, I believe, thought was that he would be given that time for gradualism, for the policy of moderation. He was wrong. And he found that out on 17 May, 1954. Supreme Court rendered its decision in Brown v. Board. And with that ruling, Ike's time ran out. In spite of his presidential assertions that he agreed with the unanimous decision, Eisenhower, the man, believed that the justices had, had vastly overstepped their authority. To intimates, he railed against the, quote, political stupidity of the court. I am convinced, he told his speechwriter, Emmett J. Hughes, that the Supreme Court decision will set back black progress in the South by 15 years. The President knew that most white Southerners would oppose Brown. And as he wrote to his friend, John Hazlitt, laws are rarely effective unless they represent the will of the majority. When pressed on his personal opinion of the court's decision, he would simply say that it was the ruling of the law of the land and as the President, he was required to enforce it. Most telling, however, the President steadfastly refused to endorse the decision of the court, and more importantly, to speak out on the immorality of segregation. As Presidential Press Secretary James Haggerty later remembered after Brown, he said, after Brown, civil rights became a whole different ball game. Indeed it did. And it was a game that would result in the confrontation at the Little Rock School desegregation crisis. And in that crisis, Eisenhower's policy, his trusted policy of moderation, would prove woefully inadequate. Not that he didn't try to use it. He sought to avoid any high-profile actions during the crisis, any high-profile pronouncements. Four times during the crisis, he dispatched personal emissaries to Arkansas to gather information and attempt to bridge the differences between the state and national governments. He repeatedly refused advice from subordinates to turn to legislative or even forceful measures to resolve the crisis. And he sought to provide as much time as he possibly could for the people of Arkansas to accept and become comfortable with court-mandated desegregation at Little Rock Central High. In the end, of course, the ruling of the court was implemented only after the president ordered the 101st to occupy the city of Little Rock. So what happened? What happened? Why did the policy that had served Ike so well in other foreign and domestic difficult challenges fail him so completely at Little Rock? Well, there are many answers to this question, of course. Political, economic, certainly social answers. But in the minutes I have remaining, I want to key on one reason 
that I think is often ignored, and it shouldn't be. And that one reason, Orville Eugene Faubus. Faubus, of course, was the governor of Arkansas, and he was, therefore, the person with whom Ike would predominantly interact. Put simply, in that interaction, Ike underestimated Orville. Faubus was a master politician. His father had been a card-carrying, hardcore socialist. Eugene, in his name, was from Eugene V. Debs. Okay. He tried to cultivate a populist image of the perennial underdog battling great odds in defense of the common folk of Arkansas. He styled himself a moderate on racial issues, and in fact, Orville Faubus was. He had supported the integration of the colleges and universities in Arkansas. They were already integrated. Folks don't realize that. They were already integrated. But when the dispute over integration of the public schools, the high schools in Arkansas, turned ugly in the northern Arkansas town of Hoxie in 1956, Faubus, the consummate practical politician, decided to sit that one out. At his very core, that was Orville, consummate political opportunist. He possessed this, an uncanny ability to divine the strategy and objectives of his opponents and devise ways to take advantage of those strategies to achieve his own ends. After the crisis had bubbled on for a while, we can't do the whole crisis in the time allowing, but after it had bubbled on for a while, you will remember that Eisenhower sent personal emissaries down to Faubus, particularly Senator Brooks, or Congressman Brooke Hay Brooks Hayes of Arkansas, and he did, he sort of played his trump card. Still, moderation, low key, he asks Faubus to come to Newport. Now here is Ike. This is Eisenhower, yeah? The general, the president, the man, calling Faubus to him. Well, Faubus said, of course, I'd be glad to come. And they meet at Newport. 14 September, Eisenhower opened the meeting by getting in Faubus' face. He sternly reminded him in no uncertain terms, that the instructions of a federal court must be followed by a state to the letter. Now, if he left it right there, who knows what would have happened? But Faubus countered, quickly assuming his all shucks persona. He listened attentively while the president talked, and then, like a snake charming a bird, he began to cast his spell. He reminded the president that only a few years earlier, Captain Faubus had been crossing the English Channel as a member of General Eisenhower's invading armies. And, as he, and that as he had gazed on the hostile shores of Europe, he had thanked his God that his personal fate and the fate of the free world rested securely in Eisenhower's hands. Now is then, Faubus assured the president, he was but a humble subordinate standing ready to execute the orders of his commander-in-chief. Arkansas, he insisted, was the most racially progressive state in the South, and the crisis at Little Rock could be swiftly ended if the president would just curb the dictatorial license of Herbert Brownell and his Department of Justice investigators. What we need, Faubus said, is a cooling off period, time for emotions to subside, for determination to wane. Well, this, of course, was exactly what Eisenhower wanted to hear. It fit perfectly with his whole misgivings about all this pushing and shoving over Brown. It fit perfectly with his cherished policy of moderation. And so it was that under the sustained assault of Faubus's particular blend of down-home populism, subservience, and syrupy Southern civility, Dwight David Eisenhower saw what he wanted to see and he heard what he wanted to hear. He sincerely believed that the meeting had been a complete success. The governor, he said, is appreciative. I have allowed him to beat an honorable retreat. He will go home now and direct the Arkansas National Guard to maintain order and protect the black children when they arrive at Central High. He couldn't have been more wrong. Within hours after departing the conference, Faubus informed Congressman Hayes that he had absolutely no intention of issuing any statement announcing new orders for the Guard. Upon learning of Faubus' reversal, the president realized that he'd been duped. The famous Eisenhower temper now boiled to the surface, but in a clear example 
of the immense character of the man. He admitted what had happened. And he placed the first call to his attorney general, who had advised him against meeting Faubus in the first place. You were right, Brownell, he said. Faubus broke his word. I could tell he was furious, Brownell remembered. He was now acting like a military commander-in-chief dealing with Faubus, a subordinate who had let him down in the midst of a battle. On Monday, 23 September, eight black school children entered Central High. By mid-morning, an angry crowd of more than 1,000 whites had gathered outside the school. By the way, the speed with which the random mob materialized <laughs> and the fact that it was led by one of Faubus' bird-hunting cronies <laughs> sort of leads you to believe that maybe it wasn't spontaneous anyway. Right. But things got real ugly in a, in, in a hurry. Blacks around the school there were attacked and, bleat, and, and, and beaten. And at noon, Little Rock Mayor Wilson Mann ordered the withdrawal of the black students for their own safety. The integration of Central High had lasted all of three hours. Eisenhower now knew that his policy of moderation had failed. And to the man's credit, he readily accepted that it had failed and he moved to a new means of maintaining order and implementing the court's directive. He now understood only one course of action remained open to him, and his response was both swift and decisive. In my career, he told Brownell, I have learned that if you have to use force, use overwhelming force and save lives thereby. How's this for overwhelming force? He called the Secretary of the Army, at 12.08 p.m., Secretary of the Army issued the orders, and two hours later, they had wheels up on the first aircraft, headed for the municipal airport. The black students would henceforth attend school under the protection of the paratroopers of the 327th Airborne Battle Group. Close. How then are we to assess Eisenhower in this crisis? On one hand, evidence strongly suggests that the employment of federal troops might have avoided what happened there. If only Eisenhower had demonstrated resolve early in the crisis. Instead, he clung tenaciously to his policy of moderation throughout the crisis, hoping that restraint in word and deed would lead to a solution without confrontation. Further, his silence in supporting the court's decision and the morality of segregation spoke volumes, and his lack of active support for the federal courts in general before the crisis encouraged lawlessness of those who sought to, defi to defy them. That said, as soon as he realized that his policy had failed, he readily admitted his mistake and implemented a very different policy, a policy that resulted in success. So, I begin, I'll end where I began. How do you get right with that? Thank you to our panelists. We have about 20 minutes now for questions. And um, I believe our microphone is over here. So if people have questions, if you would uh, come over to the microphone. Is that okay? Up with his, uh, you know, commenting on Dr. Sanders' point that Eisenhower was first and last a man of moderation. Can you be a leader from that position? So I'd just like everyone to think about that. Um, and I believe we have a question from the audience. Yes. First, I'd like to uh, thank. Uh, Dr. Speck for moderating for us, and uh, Dr. Sanders, and I Juris Doctorate, uh, Marshall. <clears throat> now, give you just a, a very brief background. I went to uh, Topeka West High School, graduated in 1972, and which was six, seven, you know, quite a few years after Brown versus Board. And we had a total of, my best recollection, three black students at about 1,600 students, even at that time. And it was kind of an interesting process of how the zoning went. <clears throat> that said, um, and I, I feel like uh, I suffered for it. Mm -hmm. I felt like I, I was really, when I went to uh, Kansas University after that, it, it was, I was culture shock. I didn't know how black people acted. I didn't know how, 
I just knew there was trouble over at Topeka High and that sort of thing. We just didn't. But I remember the days of blockbusters where people would actually pay off the realtors not to sell to black people because the perception was, mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly, that uh, your uh, value of your home would go down if a black family moved in. And that didn't set right with me, but it was a fact of the times. Now, I guess I have two-part question. Um, and I want to address affirmative action for just a moment. It's my understanding that um, in the case of several, uh, several cities, and I believe also in Topeka where I'm now residing, um, black students are allowed to go to, to have a choice of going to any high school they want within the city 501 district, which I'm in favor of. However, that same right is not afforded non-children or students of color. And affirmative action has always been a, a controversial subject. And I'd, I'd just like to kind of get some feedback from you and, and uh, see what you think of it. One other note I wanted to say that uh, I find it kind of ironic that, uh, you know, the blacks served with distinction during the Civil War. Yeah. And black, I bet with, yeah. I bet with uh, white officers. Mm -hmm. um, and they also, there was a, the ski airmen, for example, mm -hmm. served in military. But there was very limited. They were relegated to other duties and that sort of thing, but they did serve the country with distinction. They did a lot, they did a lot of driving and, uh, of course, kitchen and that sort of thing. Cool. But um, that said, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on that. And uh, just basically, do you think the time for affirmative action is here or is outdated? You know, and as you criticize, or, or the criticism of Eisenhower also kind of struck me, and I'll, I'll end with this, is that you have to understand that the times. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the mores of that time. I think it was groundbreaking. You know, we, we look at what's happening with don't ask, don't tell reversal and what a controversy that is. Mm -hmm. Well, you can imagine the, the quantum leap he made by integrating the military and the schools and that sort of thing. So I think, the, I think he had a good uh, basis in terms of a slow but steady because if you'd thrown all that at one time, mm -hmm. I think it would have been a mass revolt. Yeah. And if, I'll say, yeah. sir. Well, um, first of all, thank you for sharing your experience because it, it's, um, we're, we're similar era in, in terms of uh, schooling, but um, a, and it's uh, it's fairly recent, the, and the numbers were still off. And, and I, I share your view that the uh, the shared experiences can help all of us um, as as we go forward and deal with um, with life's challenges, um, and and that that for me gets to the the affirmative action question, which is. Um, a, the, the, the ideal of, of a diverse society and, and particularly in um, education where there are opportunities for individuals to not only enrich themselves and prepare for, uh, for professional life, mm -hmm. but also to gain a broader um, understanding of, of our collective experience as a society. So I, 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 I believe that um, Affirmative action is, is in, it, in its most general form, a program that our country needs to continue to pursue in various forms, but um, there are clearly pieces of it that need adjustment. So uh, President Clinton, for whom I worked, uh, characterized it as um, mend it, don't end it. Um, I, I believe that part of that concept needs to be an effort to make sure that educational opportunity programs bring uh, a full breadth of diversity and partic with particular emphasis on um, individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds regardless of race. But I think that, that um, I'm, I, look, I'm well aware that there gets to be a point where uh, different um, demographic groups start to push up against others. Mm -hmm. And we have, unfortunately, um, limited opportunities ultimately, but I, I don't think we're to that point where um, we, we can afford to sort of stop trying to find people to bring diversity in, in all its forms to um, our educational opportunities and our economic opportunities. My, uh, my take, much the same, I'll simply add, uh, I support affirmative action, uh, and I will confess to you it's uh, primarily a, uh, my reasons are primarily selfish. Uh, I want uh, as much as any American to have as strong an America as we can have. And in history, we talk about the diversity of the tapestry. 
right? We go out and we try to find every little piece of every little story. And it's not because we're just trying to shove, oh, we got to talk about women for a little bit. And now, you know, now we have to talk about Indians for a little bit. Now, no, no, that's part of the story. And you don't have the whole story until you have all of that, right? We don't have a whole nation. We need everybody. So if they want to bus a deserving child from one part of Topeka to another, then I say good. Good for the black child and good for the white children. The point that Mr. Marshall makes about that bumping up against, that's the cause of a lot of the friction, you know? But that's also success. That's what you're hearing out there is success. Right? When the two of us were kids, there wasn't any danger of bumping. <laughs> no danger at all. Right? My high school didn't desegregate until 1967, 10 years after Brown. And immediately all the white kids left, went to a trumped up school in the back of somebody's barn. Right? And the school went from 100% white to 98% black. Just like that overnight. We're past that. Bump away. That's Thank you very much. My name is Autumn Fox, and I'm an attorney, and my question is for Mr. Marshall. And Mr. Marshall, you spoke about President Eisenhower's <coughs> judicial appointments and the importance to President Eisenhower of the moral fiber of those judges and the impact of those decisions. And um, as a lawyer who appears in front of many courts, it is, I would ask, I suppose, for your comment, but it's my opinion that appointments now are based more on political correctness than they are on moral fiber and courage. And I think that your father so foresaw that when he resigned and said that he did not want his seat to become the black seat. He wanted his seat to go to the most qualified judge. The other thing that I would ask you to speak to is that um, I think that many citizens don't recognize the impact of judges' decisions on their lives, whether that is a state district court judge or whether it's a federal district court judge or Supreme Court judge. In the state of Kansas, when we vote, um, we have retention largely, for first of all, for a court of appeals and for the uh, Supreme Court in the state of Kansas. And I know many people who vote either all yes or all no and know nothing about those judges. And when our district court judges are up for retention vote, they really know nothing about them. So I agree with you wholeheartedly about the importance of the appointments. I would like your comments about whether you believe it's still based on moral fiber and courage or on political correctness, and also to please um, address uh, as I've tried to do when I speak at public functions, the importance of people knowing who our judges are, what they do, and how they impact your life. Um, well, thank you. Um, that's a lot, that's a lot to, to address. Let me give it a try. Um, on, on judicial appointments, one of, one of the things that's, that's become um, very disturbing um, is, is that there are there is a near inability to get judges confirmed, and this is this is something which um, started several presidents ago, but it it grew quite a bit during um, the presidency of George W. Bush, um, and it's sort of reaching a crescendo now with uh, a, a real inability to get judges confirmed. Um, the the impact that these judges have now part of it is because it dovetails back into um, the, the lifetime tenure and the kind of impact that a judge can have over a long period of time. Judge Frank Johnson, who we discussed earlier, for example, um, was given his Medal of Freedom. He was appointed to the bench by President Eisenhower. He received the Medal of Freedom for his work uh, from President Clinton in the 90s. Uh, their you know, longevity in these positions um, uh, has, has its effect. Uh, I think um, on the issue of Political correctness, as juxtaposed with moral fiber um, and courage, uh, probably going to get a little trouble for saying this, but I, I think we have sort of devolved in, into a situation where there is there is sort of a, a first box on the checklist, which is um, I'm, I'm not so sure I would characterize it as uh, political correctness, but there is this need to. Uh, find nominees who are going to be uh, going to satisfy that least common denominator because of the the um, 
the lack of an ability to get judges confirmed. So any kind of uh, blemish in a nominee's record is likely to delay his or her ability to get through a process. Um, it's gotten to the point actually. So if you can find someone who on the one hand um, is going to have um, sort of a, a low negatives or potential negatives um, but nevertheless has the kind of moral fiber and courage that we want and expect from our judges that the that, that possibility is still there to thread that needle. It's just become very difficult. And frankly, I think um, there, there's, an, there's an unfortunate byproduct to that, which is why would someone who has thrown themselves into a, a career doing these kinds of things put themselves through a process where uh, they may be strung out with, with um, endless background checks and hearings only to find that they never get a vote? Um, I, I've been of the view for quite a while now that um, one of the other related unfortunate aspects of, of American politics in recent years has been that uh, presidents who gain re-election don't seem to have a lot of time to um, exercise the authority that they've, they've gotten um, upon being re-elected. Um, I, I think there's several parts of our process where we, we're not allowing our leaders to be able to fully exercise their authority and judicial appointments is one of them. Um, we have time for just one more quick question. We're down to the last minute or so of our program. My name is Pam Friesner. I also grew up in Topeka, Kansas, um, uh, under much the same conditions as this other gentleman. Um, but I wanted to uh, to thank both of you, both for the inspiration and the, the information you brought today and wish I would have had it a little bit earlier um, and to mix with my experience to change my perspectives. However, um, caring for elderly parents has brought me back to Topeka, Kansas after 30 years. And um, I am proud and pleased to say that I work at a school in the shadow of the Brown versus Board of Education building, the old Monroe, Monroe School Building. And um, it's a magnet school where 30%, 30 percent, 30 plus percent of our children get to choose whether or not to come there from anywhere, including outside of Topeka. Uh, our school is a magnet school that teaches science and fine arts. But I am proud and pleased, as I think uh, I could be as well, that uh, we have around 40 percent black students at our school, 30 plus percent Hispanic students. And, uh, and work on uh, all the issues still continuously, but less and less of them are racial issues, more of them because they're disadvantaged students. And I wanted to thank you for all you brought Bless to the you. table in mm -hmm. educating and, and informing us on Bless that. You. Thank you. Well, with that, um, our time is up today. Thank, I would like to thank everyone for, for coming, and also if you have other questions for our panelists, I, I hope that they would be willing to stick around for a few minutes so that uh, they could meet you and address some of your concerns. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.